everyone. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, so that's because you have been raptured. <laughs> Seeing that we're going to talk about eschatology tonight, yeah, maybe you you believe that my view of eschatology is wrong. <laughs> but anyway, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Crossroads. Yeah, we are using a new platform to um, do our our uh, live streaming, and so yeah, I pressed the wrong button, and, and off I was, and I'm the host for tonight. So yeah, good good evening, everyone. Welcome to to this evening's uh, broadcast of Crossroads. Uh, I trust you had a good weekend and a blessed Lord's Day yesterday. And yeah, tonight we are doing something that we've decided on a while ago that once a month we will do a Q and A, uh, whereby, whereby we will ask you uh, as followers and uh, uh, of Crossroads to send us in some questions. And so we received some questions which we will be discussing tonight, and I'll put them on on the screen a bit later, mm -hmm. one by one. So, yeah, just another word of welcome again then to Crossroads with me tonight. I'm your host and with me tonight is is um, Colin Wyatt Goodall uh, and uh, Matthew Mellers. Uh, good evening, guys. Uh, how's it going, Yaku? Yeah, hey, okay. uh, good. Hi, okay, man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just to... Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Just to remind uh, the, the, our audience that... Um, uh, we have a Facebook page called, called Crossroads Cape. Please like it, and then you will also um, get regular updates from, from our our program and what we plan to do and our shows. We also have a huge YouTube channel called Crossroads Cape where you also can subscribe, and maybe I will also, after tonight's, uh, this evening's um, uh, uh, broadcast, share those links there where you can just subscribe. And, yeah, we would like to ask you to share these links and these programs with your friends our aim is to 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 try and you know spread biblical truth um and 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 address issues of church culture uh, and gospel of our day yeah so without then uh, going into any further because we've got a long lineup let me put some of the questions that we've received uh up uh the first one i will now put up on the screen is what is the difference between classical progressive dispensationalism and covenant theology? Now, guys, you 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 thought that um, if you open up questions and answers, that you should know that the first one <laughs> that you will get <laughs> is a, a, a theology question. So, yeah, so our first question for tonight is this one, and it's not an easy one. So, I think uh, a few li a few listeners actually asked about this, and I think just by way of introduction for my part, and I think we all would agree, is that um, I think all of th three of us is basically in the same camp, roughly, I think. Um, and we don't want to say that when we address this topic, we not, we're not coming down on our brothers and sisters who differ with us. We want to, you know, say that I think uh, in, in terms of eschatology, uh, you know, there's more than one view, and I think uh, although I, I have personally have strong disagreements with, for example, dispensationalism, uh, we can still uh, view them as evangelical in the sense that we must all agree that Christ bodily ascended into heaven and promised that he will come back and he will bodily come back for the final judgment. So in the broader context, we have to agree on those things. But within that framework, there are differences and some of them are big differences. So, yeah, I think... Guys, with that first question there on the screen, um, can we start <clears throat> thinking about it? Let's yeah. maybe start first with the first two, classical and progressive dis dispensationalism. What is the differences there? Uh, I think by the nature of tonight's program, let's stick with the broad broad and big picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what is the big differences between classical and progressive dispensationalism? Yes, yeah, oh, I, I don't mind um, actually tackling that, that Yaku. Um, just to point out that a lot of people, when they hear the word dispensationalism, they like to think that it's only dealing with the end times, when really what dispensationalism means is it's a way of reading the Bible where people interpret that God deals with his people differently in different eras or different dispensations. You know, so he dealt with Noah in a specific way. He dealt with Israel in a specific way. He deals with the church in a specific way. And in the end times, he's going to deal with people in a specific way. And um, 
they put a strong emphasis on on interpreting the text literally and they have a special way oh, let me not let me try to be charitable they interpret the old testament prophecies in a very literal way where they reject what what most of us in reform circles would call typology so they don't see old testament prophecies as being fulfilled in as types of christ but rather it's old testament prophecy needs to be filled exactly the way it is specified um which poses massive problems um you know for them um you know so when they read revelation and it, it speaks of a temple they can't interpret that as a church it has to be understood as a temple um you know israel and the promises given to israel and this is one of the biggest differences we have israel and the promises given to israel is for the nation of israel and those cannot carry over to the church under any circumstances and while they like to say they super literalistic when the city of god comes down as a cube <coughs> most of them don't interpret that to be a literal cube but you know then they, they try and um and you know give a more literary understanding but altogether that's usually what dispensationalists believe is that old testament prophecy specifically for israel is for israel and Israel only, and, and God deals with the church in a different way. Now, that poses many problems, um, you know, especially when we listen to the teaching of Jesus and how he claims to fulfill so much of this Old Testament prophecy. And about the, the 70s and 80s, you had a new form of dispensationalism come along called progressive dispensationalism. And what they're trying to do is take classical dispensationalists which is like the olden days Schofield, Derby dispensationalism, and try and make it fit that kind of understanding. So, um, and, and what you end up with is, is, is they bring typology back. Um, and really what it's doing is shifting dispensationalism more towards covenant theology. And so they bring typology back and they don't hold, hold to hard and fast dispensations, but they rather say that, God deals with people differently, but the things flow over from one era to the next. And so they'll still believe in like a seven-year tribulation and all of that. <coughs> they believe in something called the already not yet principle, which you may have heard of people talking about when they talk about the end time. So things were fulfilled in Christ, but not fully. There's also a second fulfillment in these prophecies in Israel. And that's the major difference between a classical dispensationalism, dispensationalist and a progressive one. Um, and so a progressive dispensationalist will see the church in Israel as a bit more closer together. Um, covenant theology, just to, to add on that, rejects that whole understanding of the Bible. Covenant theology sees God dealing with his people through covenant, um, mainly through the covenant of grace, through his grace that he, he offers to his people. And so God offered his covenant of grace and showed his grace to Adam, to Abraham, to Noah, all the way through the Bible, to David, and ultimately that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so the church is just an expansion, an outworking of Israel. In the same way the people of Israel were saved, Christians today are saved, and that is in Christ Jesus Himself. There isn't this separating of God's special of God's people, where there's, um, you know, the nation of Israel and God dealing with them in one way, and um, the church and God dealing with them in another way. In, in covenant theology, we see God's covenant running through Scripture rather than different things happening in different epochs. Yeah. Um um the little like let, let me just also say from the uh, from the outset um uh, uh i'm not a i'm not a complete expert on on uh, uh, progressive dispensationalism uh it's it's quite a new movement it roughly started uh i think here in the 80s late 80s mid 80s and it was a it was an attempt to and try address the differences and the divisions between um uh, covenant theology and dispensationalism and try to come and move closer and to see if there is not points of agreement. So things like uh, um, um, classical dispensationalism will say that Jesus has not ascended David's throne yet, mm -hmm. although they will acknowledge in a certain way Jesus is reigning, but that reign is limited in a sense, while 
uh, covenant theology says Jesus has ascended. When he ascended into heaven, he has ascended onto the throne of David, and he is ruling over God's people, which is the Israel of God. Now, dispensationalism has to make that distinction because they believe church and Israel is different. So if they say that, that Jesus has ascended the throne of David now, it would mean that Jesus is ruling over Israel. And so they can't say that because they believe Israel's dispensation is in the future when the church has been removed and Christ returned to reestablish the, the, the thousand years millennial reign where Christ will then reign uh, over his Israel. The, the physical Israel, while covenant theology believed church is the, is the Israel of God and God only has one people and Jesus is now already on the throne of David. Promises, the promises to David was fulfilled in the church. So covenant theology will see most of the, not most, in fact, all of the promises made to Israel being fulfilled in the church in the sense that God had only one people and will always have one people, which is the, the, the Israel, which was just expanded into the New Testament. Now, to get closer to that, that progressive dispensationalists said, okay, we can acknowledge that, that in a certain sense, David has ascended the throne, but not, they, they talk, they, they emphasize this thing of the, the yet and the not yet. So in a certain sense, they, Jesus has yet, has ascended the throne, but not, not yet fully. It will only be fully accomplished in the millennial reign when Jesus and after that, through the millennial reign and after that when Jesus will fully uh, ascend to the throne of David. So they came closer to try and to narrow the gap between covenant theology yeah. and, and classical dispensationalism. Um, there's also things how they see the kingdom. I'm not so very clear on that, but I've, I've heard some things about that. Um, you know, the nature of the kingdom that we have now, how, how covenant theology sees God's kingdom now is fully realized, but, uh, but will fully be accomplished in, after the return of Jesus in the new heaven and earth. But there's no, there's, no, there's no limits. It's not like the kingdom is only half come. The kingdom has fully come, although it is not, not fully realized in its full culmination, in the full reality of it. Um, Class progressive dispensationists will move closer to that and say, yes, they can agree with that yet, but not yet uh, approach. But they still make a distinction how Israel fits today into that kingdom, the physical Israel. They then, although they acknowledge <laughs> that part, they will then agree with classical dispensationism and saying, but that the promises to Abram that a certain, a certain part of land in the east that was promised to physical Israel will still go to Israel physically and that will be realized in the in the uh, thousand year millennial reign mm. so I must be honest it's, it's, a, it's a bit of, of a, a funny um, um, uh, is not a word but it's a it's a way of trying to get closer between uh, 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 closer to covenant theology but still holding on to classical dispensationalism and then that's why how progressive dispensationalism is, is sandwiched in the middle of the two. Um, but yet the, the, the clear distinctions is still there. They still believe yeah. in the seventh year. They still believe yeah. in the rapture. They still believe uh, in the millennial, physical millennial, millennial reign, which is still a big difference. Um, so although there was a, uh, um, also, there's also about hermeneutics. They, 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 they say they will ab adopt the, the covenant theology hermeneutical view. Uh, the grammatical, uh, historical, literal view, uh, whereas classical dispensationalism will be more hardcore, literal. Mm. Uh, progressives come much closer, but the outcome of their theology in the in the main remains the same. So it's difficult to say their their attempt to move closer was actually realized, which I don't think so. Yeah, I would I would say just to <coughs> add to try and. Um, you know, people who know me know my views on dispensationalism, um, and I'm not not always as charitable as I should be. But I will say that it's commendable to see people within that movement see error and say, let's try and correct our system to be more biblical. You know, and, and I would just say to progressive dispensationalist friends, I commend you for that, but you only fixed half of the errors. You now need to fix the other half and become covenantal. Um, 
but yeah, they, <laughs> <laughs> they may disagree with me on that. Yeah, there's there's also yeah. another another area where they try to move closer. You know, they say, for example, the church is not a, a distinct anthropological group. In other words, they they will they will move closer towards reading the church, you know, and, and Israel in a more literal sense. So they say there's a spiritual Israel where we are one, but there are yet still these two groups where you know classical dispensationalists will be more. Um, hardcore in what, how they make the distinction. And they would say, no, there are two physical people and there are two different timelines for these two physical people. Um, classical, well, uh, well, I think progressive guys either, will move closer yeah. to that. Yeah. But I think that also, I mean, on, in the classical sense, you know, even their view of salvation in Old Testament would be different uh, to a progressive. So, you know, if, if you had to think of, you know, guys on the progressive uh uh, scale, uh, so to speak, um, you know, their, their view of salvation is, you know, there's only one way to be saved uh, through faith in Lord Jesus Christ, whereas from a classical perspective, it's real Doc Schofield and his views on salvation, uh, you know, uh, th there's almost two different plans of redemption when it comes to, you know, the nation of Israel and um, and those in the Old Testament compared to those in the New. So, yeah, that, that's, that, that's also quite a substantial difference between the two uh, you know groups yeah so I don't know uh, is there anything that you guys yeah. think we can still add to that I think that's for me uh, the major differences um, and I would be to be honest I would still say uh, in comparing the three um, you know although although there's this there's an attempt to try and move closer it's still a, a, it's still a, a major difference. It is a, a complete different framework of reading the Bible. Covenant yeah. theology see the whole Bible as a unity, um, in, a, in a horizontal layer, as a one covenant people, God having a covenant and traveling through this world with his covenant <clears throat> people on their way to the eternal promised land. And that Israel, uh, and, and we don't talk about, uh, pro, we, in, in covenant theology, we don't talk about um, replacement theology. We talk about continuationism <laughs> in a certain yeah. way. Israel is just continuing to be Israel, and they are continuing to, there was always Old Testament church, and there's New Testament church, but it's still one church, and it's still the Israel of God. So, so covenant theology see this unity in the Bible, how God started revealing himself, progressive revelation and 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 uh, um, pro, uh, uh, progressive dispensationalists funny enough that's why they call themselves progressive dispensationalists adopt that idea not anymore of distinct vertical dis uh, 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 um, vertical dispensations but more horizontal horizontal progressive dispensations it's still dispensations but in a progressive way where there's more unity brought between the different dispensations yeah. But it's still yeah. very much different as, as how covenant theology see the whole Bible as a unit uh, uh, under God's King, Jesus Christ, reigning over God's one people and how he journeyed with them throughout this world while where they had a temporary promised land, which was Canaan, and uh, that will be fully realized in the eternal promised land through the church. And how, you know, Jesus said, I am the temple. And Jesus said, he's the Israel. He's the real Israel. He's the real temple. And Hebrews is actually a, a very good eschatological book, in my view. If you read here from chapter 5, I think, and upwards, it, it states the distinctions between how things were in the Old, Old Testament and how they are now. And how, how we now look to a heavenly temple. How we now come to a heavenly mountain. How we now have a heavenly high priest. So everything that was and is fully realized in the church in Christ. And that's still a big dis dis distinction between classic, progressive, and covenant theology. Gus, is there anything that we can still add here, or should we move on to the next question? I think we should move on, yeah. I think on, yeah. Times, yeah. The, the next one is related. I think we can maybe be short in this one because I think yeah. we already, um, you know, we're busy 20 minutes already on this first question and there's still a lot to get through. The second one is, is dispensationalism reformed? Now, no. 
Again, <laughs> again, no, it's, well, it's, it's, well, well, look, I've, I've got very good friends that are that are dispensationalists, that are Calvin, that are Calvinists. So, and they are very clear and actually saying this, you know. So we are the same when it comes to, uh, you know, we we believe in the doctrines of grace, um, you know, you know the five points of Calvinism. Uh, yet they actually will are quite clear in the sense that they aren't reformed. Uh, so, because again, I think, you know, reform theology and covenant theology go hand in hand. And what I think we've discussed the differences. So, um, no, I mean, I think both camps would agree on this. Like, I think there are some dispensational brothers who say, well, no, well, they, 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 they have kept reforming. But uh, I think as a whole, you know, it, it, you know in, in, in Christian circles uh, and reform circles, uh, there is an agreement of there is a difference between Calvinism uh, and reform theology to an extent. Now there, there, are, there are obviously similarities, but there are there are clear differences as well. Yeah, I, yeah, if I, I think I just add yeah. to that quickly. Sorry, I could to, to jump in there. Like, let, sorry, sorry, let me just let me just add quickly something before you go. I just want to say right from the outset, that's what I wanted to say. Again, this is one of those sensitive topics, and we want to be grace, gracious and loving towards our friends. So please, those who differ with us and. And when we say, for example, that we don't view dispensationalism as fully reformed, I mean, there's our reasons how we view that is still our viewpoint. So please don't be offended by that. This is not our, uh, uh, we are still in the camp of being evangelical and Calvinistic in our approach towards scripture and interpretation of scripture. But I think let's be honest with the view of what is reformed. And I, I accept the fact that those who are on the other side of the camp will view themselves more reformed than us. You know, which is which we accept and we respect. Sorry, mm -hmm. Colin, you can go on. So I was going to say, when we identify as reformed, you know, we're not just what we're trying to do is go beyond just saying we're Protestant. We're trying mm -hmm. to say we align with the theology of the reformers, and so then we hold to the confessions of the Reformation period. You know, and and we may differ on that. There's there are confessional differences, but mm -hmm. dispensationalism doesn't fit any confession from the reformation period there's no reformed confession that you can hold to and hold to dispensationalism uh, unfortunately it's like that uh, you know and i say that um you know i i love john MacArthur's ministry uh, he, he's not reformed uh, hmm. you know i'll say that and, and i say that as like i'm an ant and he's a giant like he this is, is a true spiritual giant but mm -hmm. we cannot say he's reformed by what we define as reform. And I think, Colin, as I said, and, and the reason why I mention that is, you know, good friends of mine have said they're not reform that are, that are, for instance, MacArthurites in a sense, because I think MacArthur himself has distinguished himself, uh, you know, in terms of his view compared to the reformers. Yeah, I think he loves the reformers, but he's, I think, been honest enough to say there are clear differences. So, yeah, I don't think this is not, this is not speaking down to anyone in any mm, sense. Yeah. This is more just saying there's a clear difference and, I think again, both camps uh, actually recognise that that difference. Um, so again, I mean, you know, you even look at, you know, if you even look in Solar Far, for instance, there's you know Reformed Baptists, and there are there are Baptist churches that are dispensational, uh, and uh, there those that are covenantal. Yet, I think in the true sense, if you are if you are saying you are a Reformed Baptist church, as um, you know, Colin mentioned, you're holding on to you know a confession like the 1689. So mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, again, this I'm sure our dispensational brothers would hold, would probably hold a, would agree with a lot of what the 1689 says, but they'll hear the chapter seven. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I think it's it would be then fair to say one should to answer this question. One will have to, will have to answer what is reformed. What does it yeah. mean to be reformed? Now, I mean that can also differ how different people would view that, but historically. Um, Let's say what historically it has meant to be reformed. It reformed means being covenantal. That was historically what it means to being to be holding to covenant theology. And reformed is much more than just tulip. That I'm, that we must also accept. Yeah. You can rather you can rather hold yourself to Calvinism or being a Calvinist if you believe only in tulip. But reformed is in is a, is a, is a worldview. Is much more than just five points or a certain hermeneutical approach. But there's a big difference in our hermeneutical approach between dispensationalism and covenant theology. There's a big difference, and we need to acknowledge those differences. I think all of us would like to stand in the line of Protestants, and we can. But being Protestant doesn't necessarily mean you're reformed. 
being Calvinist doesn't necessarily mean you are reformed. I think things like the re the regulative principle of worship, how we worship, um, how you read scripture, um, soteriology, uh, eschatology, uh, um, and the, the whole whole view of church, how you uh, church liturgy, all those things are all reformed, defi reform re defined in reformed theology. So you, if you hold to certain part of that. Uh, you, you, we must be honest with ourselves and said, I am reformed in my theology, but you can't then say I am reformed as in the literal sense. Now, I know this um, might, I, mean, I know this people is going to differ with this, but that, that's the reality. I think how we see, how we see things here <clears throat> on crossroads. And it's not something that we say we want to, you know, throw a certain part out or be haughty in our view. But this is just, I think, the reality how most, classical reformed people will view being reformed in the true sense and call yourself a reformed church. Yeah. Hmm. Guys, anything else? Yeah. No, I think uh, can we move on, on to the, the next one? Yeah. yeah. All right. So the third question is there on the screen now. When moving to, uh, we've received basically questions in two big areas, uh, major areas. Uh, eschatology and then we've received a couple of questions um in around marriage um and then i think we receive another question around um more theological in nature and the last one about um sharing the gospel or evangelism so the next two questions we have is in the area of marriage and i must be honest it's a it's a tough question i think we must tread lightly here yeah? um you know uh, i I'm, I'm i'm i've studied theology i've served as an elder uh, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching regularly, but I'm st I haven't still pastored the church for many years. So I, I would not call and not put myself out as a someone who can walk around and answer all questions on this topic. Uh, it's really difficult questions. And so I think by introduction, I would say we are sharing our view. I mean, if you open yourself for questions, you, you will receive any kind of question. And these are one of those tough ones that we receive. But let's un answer them as we honestly believe they stand there. So the question is, can a divorced man be appointed and affirmed as an elder? What do you guys yes. say? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like start. So I'm going to say yes and no. Hmm. Colin? No. <laughs> no look, I, 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 I was going to say possibly. Yeah, I'm going gonna gonna gonna, gonna, gonna to be quite brief with my answer. So what I mean is there's obviously there's underlying factors um, we have to look at. Uh, I think there's clear evidence again if you even look at the pastoral epistles of the qualifications of an elder and again we don't need to go through all of those but mm -hmm. uh, the reality is here is that and again uh, maybe let's just make this very practical so i think you know as, as a panel we would all agree if a man for instance has committed adultery on his wife uh, and he gets divorced in that case and sorry let me just uh, reiterate and he is a believer i think it's quite important mm -hmm. um he would be disqualified. However, in the same regard, you could have a man that's committed adultery on his wife and he's an unbeliever, uh, and then he comes to saving faith in Christ, then I think the answer is slightly nuanced and different. So I think that that's why Yaku was saying it's not it's not a just a, a simple yes or no. Uh, there's many factors to take into consideration when you're looking at, uh, I guess, this question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think let's 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 just talk about divorce. So there can be different reasons for divorce. Hmm. You can be divorced because you committed adultery, and in that sense, exactly. it's a no-no. I don't think someone, not I don't think it's true, and I and I can speak from from my church perspective as well, the church that I belong to. If someone has been divorced due to adultery, he will not be re, he will not be uh, he will be restored to fellowship through repentance and discipline, but he will not be allowed into eldership or, or in pastoral ministry. This is the church order of my church. It will not, and I, I, I agree with that, and I think it's biblical. The one that I think is difficult that needs more conversation on is if, 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 your, if the wife now commits adultery um, and there's a divorce out of that, still, it's not so easy because, you know, although there's reasons for divorce there, and I'm very careful here because these are a difficult one uh, uh, to, to say what I'm saying. If, although there's reasons for divorce, if, 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 if you're, for example, the, the wife commits adultery, he, the husband has reasons to say, I'm not willing to stay. But he can also say, he will be allowed in, in a biblical sense to say, I'm divorcing.
because that's the biblical grounds for divorce. But if he stays, if he then does divorce, there's still questions about that the high esteem the Bible puts on pastoral ministry and preaching from the pulpit um, with the tag, you are divorced, although there might be biblical reasons for that divorce. But I think that's a longer conversation. It's not yeah. so easy as just to say no, as in the first case. But I would still say there might be reasons, even in that case, not um, for someone to be an elder or a pastor. Yeah, I just I, w I would just add t two things, and it's very much along the lines of what you guys have already raised there. You know, the first one is, is when we consider somebody who's an unbeliever and, and maybe has gone through a divorce as mm -hmm. an unbeliever, if you want to have a hard, fast, no, this is not possible kind of approach, we, you then have to consider what you're saying about the gospel, about being given newness of life, about being regenerated, about knowing where we came from, all of us, not just divorced people, and, and being restored, um, you know, in fullness to Christ. Um, you know, and, and you could s earnestly seek um, you know, even though you're divorced, you could earnestly want to seek reconciliation with your wife or ex-wife, and she wants none of it. You know, th there's so many s factors that we have to consider there. Um, but then on the flip side of the coin, you know, people who, who want to say, um, you know, no, we, um, you know, you, we should just allow it. We need to consider what the Bible says about elders. You know, it says that he should... Um, manage his household well, manage his family well in a manner worthy of full respect, um, that he should be a man who's above reproach. He must have a good reputation with outsiders. Uh, you know, these are things that we do have to consider when appointing an elder. And, and sometimes something like a divorce can legitimately mar those kinds of marks on a person. And, and I don't think it's as easy as just saying, yes, they can or no, they cannot. Mm. I, I think that it, it takes much wisdom. It takes the wisdom of elders, and, and I'm not. But well, one of the things, maybe just senses, to, yeah. uh, maybe one of the things just to consider w within this conversation, um, a couple of things that this cross my mind now would be the following. I think we live in a society where divorce is rampant. No one is denying that. So I think we also in a we in a culture in a church culture where. There are many disqualified men because of this divorcing, uh, you know, being divorced, um, and are unqualified uh, from the Bible and are still in leadership positions such as elders. So one of the things we also need to consider would, would be, I think sometimes even if it's a very maybe nuanced case, the, the question might be in that scenario. Based on the culture, ba based on what you know, the church, the world sees within church circle these days. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, almost the, the wise decision would be, you know, perhaps maybe I'm not going to even go this route because I actually don't want those questions, and I, I don't want that, you know, almost that reproach on Christ's name um, because you know there, there might be, you know, just I think a lot of noise around a decision like that. So. I think it's a very difficult uh, uh, thing to consider. And I, I think there's there's many factors to to look at when you um, mm. when you can answer this. Uh, so th I think I think there's some very black and white areas on this question. Mm. Uh, yet there are there are other uh, other scenarios where, yeah, I, I, th I don't even think it's a question of is the person not qualified or unqualified. It's actually saying, well, is this the wisest thing to do in this scenario? Yeah, yeah. I think. The, the, the thing that we need to stick with is what the Bible says. The Bible says he must be above reproach. He must be a married man, someone who manages his family well, someone whose children are, is, 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 is believers and behaved, well, let's say behaved, and there's a sense in that that we can see he preaches and bring the gospel to his family. Mm -hmm. um, it's not speaking about perfectionism, but it's definitely yeah. speaking about above reproach and being an example in marriage. Ephesians 5 tells us that marriage is a prophetic voice of the gospel of Christ and his church. So our focus should not be to try and justify our, our uh, brokenness to the extent that we try our best to get somebody back into ministry. Our approach is for the glory of Christ, we must even put ourselves down. And in that sense, if you ask me honestly, 
I would say uh, a pastor is someone who has a married family, who is not divorced, who is taking well care of his home, who shows by his life to the world and to the church that is above reproach and that he leads by example. Um, that doesn't mean that one is unloving in making such a statement. We should all accept that reality where we lay our lives down for the honor of Christ and, and the church and honor that high calling God has placed. And, and what James has said, not everyone should preach the word because there's a big, massive responsibility on that. And, you know, unbelievers walk into a church that don't know everything. They just hear, oh, the pastor is a divorced man and he's remarried. He doesn't know what's the context. Uh, we should never be a stumbling block for the gospel. Even mm. if, in, if something happens to us when we are not so, we are not maybe directly responsible for, but for the sake of the gospel, we will lay our lives down to lead by an example. I would say that's my answer. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. All right. Let's so, I, yeah. So let's, let me just also say there's many questions that come through on this topic, but we've already now quite a while on. Um, please don't, if we don't answer all questions and we don't address all comments, don't feel we, we don't want to speak to your address. It's really just, uh, we hope you understand and accept that there's a lot of questions and it's a difficult topic and the nuances can get so varied. And, and I think not, 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 not one of us here is in pastoral ministry for 30 or 50 years that can yeah. answer all, all. So please just accept that in the humbleness is not to be unkind. Okay. The next one we would like to look at is, um, we are. What are the what are the biblical requirements <laughs> for for divorce? So, guys, I think you know the same as the as the eschatology uh, one. You know, we, we we live unfortunately in a time where these are questions that's all over. I know them. They they are there. Everyone has asked these questions now, and I think it's good questions. It's good that we talk about this. Again, I think I will answer this from my brokenness and in my humbleness. I don't know everything. Um, I can just say, uh, if I can answer that, the, there's clear, the clear ones in the Bible is very clear. If you commit adultery, that's grounds for divorce. I think those are the clear ones. They are easy, they're clear, they are there. Um, and the other one is when um, an unbelieving partner wants to leave, um, you can, he, must, he can leave. He has the freedom to leave. But the believing partner will honor the marriage. He will not leave, although the spouse is an unbeliever. If they, if he wants to, st the unbelieving spouse stay, you are committed to the marriage. Those are the two clear ones. I think the one which is often in our day, a difficult one, which there are also a lot of differences on, is to, should someone stay in a marriage when there is f a physical or emotional abuse? Um, why, when is that point? If there, is there such a point? Is that grounds for divorce? Uh, and when is that point? These are not easy. Um, yeah. let's maybe chat about if you agree with me on the first two uh, if there's more clear cases please give those examples and then let's discuss this last one that I've mentioned yeah so I think I, I agree with you on the first two um, and I would and I tried to find I'm sure it's Augustine but I know there were some church fathers that they actually take that second instance of abandon they call it abandonment so if a spouse leaves their partner they abandon them and there are some early church writings where they talk of physical abuse as abandonment. So, and what, they kind of argue that if if a spouse, so say there's a wife, a believing wife, and her unbelieving husband is beating her, um, he's technically abandoned her already. He's 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 refused to fulfil his marriage covenant, and by beating her, he's abandoning her and leaving her, and so she's free to leave. Um, that marriage. Now, that is a very gray area. I know, um, yeah, I, I know some really sound brothers who would disagree with that understanding and say, no, she should seek to stay in that marriage. Um, I, I'm personally not in that camp, but I will admit that my position of like of seeing things like physical and emotional abuse as as forms of abandonment, I'll say that isn't super soundly stored up in scripture it's not as clear as those two mm. cases you made yeah. but i, I would, think I the mean, second uh, case can be expanded to that it's mm. kind of where i sit on that mm. and i would agree with you uh, uh yeah maybe there's no there's no what you know proof text on that but um i think again this 
looking at looking at scripture as a whole, looking at even the context of marriage, what marriage represents. Um, uh, also, uh, I think that that woman, for instance, uh, obviously that's generally the case, uh, is is made in the image of God. Um, when you think of physical abuse as an example, what you mentioned, um, I, I really do think, you know, again, if you if you look at the totality of Scripture, um, that that is biblical grounds for marriage, uh, for for divorce rather, um, mm. and I, I don't see where the, where the Bible is calling uh, a woman, again, let's say, or a man, uh, to stay in a marriage where their life is in danger, their children's lives are in danger. <laughs> Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, so, yeah, again, I think there are some yeah, probably differences um, and, and nuances, again, when it comes to divorce. One thing I will say, obviously, is, you know, as Christians, we, and again, we, we see so much divorce these days for ridiculous reasons, even in Christian circles mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, even in good churches. And I guess the the, the, the one thing I will say about divorce, uh, and actually, uh, my, the pastor that married us, myself and, and, and my wife, said the following, and it, it, it always stuck with me, um, is that at the end of the day, you know, the man is called to lead the home. He's the head of the house. In a sense, the buck stops with the husband. And often, in the case of divorce, and again, I know there's different, different. Uh, um, you know, reasons maybe for divorce, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of the problem is when the man does not lead. When when the man, for instance, uh, you know, neglects his wife, and it, it could be that now the wife is is being called to to, to head up the home, uh, or again, in, in all these different scenarios. But I, I firmly believe that you know, in in most cases, you know, men need to to step up to the plate and actually to lead their homes. Uh, and I think of men, Christian men, are leading their homes, leading their wives. Um, I already do think that th there would be less divorce. So uh, I don't know that that's maybe just a personal opinion. Uh, can I, but I, I think I really think men men are called to you know to that response. You know, I think have got a higher higher responsibility in a sense. Yeah, and I just just to add on remarriage because I see there was a question about remarriage after divorce. Um, I, I again think that that. In these two cases that you have, you can remarriage in the remarry in the state of um, of adultery. But you know, even in that abandonment case in Corinthians, Paul actually says, "But then don't remarry." And so mm. I think that that remarriage is permissible in instances of adultery, but not in instances of um, abandonment. And while that may sound harsh, I think sometimes we put too high an emphasis on like people just have to get married and that's the only way you can serve a fulfilling life. Like if you've been married and, and your husband or wife has left you, um, you know, you are still the bride of Christ and you still can serve in the church wholeheartedly and use your single singleness as a gift um, in your service to the Lord. Um, so the thing about Paul's uh, word. Yeah, you know, if you, if you can, you you you, you know, if you, you know, Paul's words are almost all, well, uh, you know, follow my example. <laughs> in yeah. terms of, and you think about you think about the difficulties of uh, being in a in a in a relationship and in, in a marriage in the sense of I think Paul's clear. You know, if you're single, you almost have more time to serve the Lord. So yeah. we, we must never. I think what is sad in many churches almost is to put the singles to one side, and, and that's mm. totally not right, you know. All, uh, all the divorced people, like, I often, yeah, sorry exactly. to cut in there, yeah. I often hear of people who've who've been divorced or widowed or, you know, something like that, and they, they often speak of how they've been marginalized in the church, and I don't think we should do that. I think no, that that's... Uh, no, um, so, I think um, on the issue that we talked about, uh, the third the third uh, issue of, um, you know, abuse. And so I think, you know, Jesus showed us uh, how he, he value, well, how what he regards as murder. He said, if you call someone an idiot or a fool out of hate in your own heart um, uh, or in a prejudiced way, you are committing murder. We know sanctity of life is honored by God. God don't expect, uh, God said we must honor sanctity of life. So in that sense, we can also we should also acknowledge character murder in a marriage. 
someone has no right to murder his spouse, which is being seen by God in the same way as physical murder. So if a, if a, if a woman's life or a man's life is threatened to through physical abuse, abuse where there is even a chance that you can say, but my life is not sure anymore, I'm afraid that this person might even kill me, there, there's grounds for me for, for divorce. Yeah. And then also, if there's this character murder, which God also sees as murder, there's grounds for divorce. When In saying that, this process, to get to that point, is a very, very complex process. It's not one that's just taken lightly or overnight. I believe it's one that needs to be taken in council with your eldership or your church council over a period of time. There must be uh, the church discipline involved. There must be counseling involved. Until such a point that you make that decision with your church council, with their knowledge, clearly understanding what's going on in the marriage, clearly knowing that there's there's now a long while that there was counseling here, and this <clears throat> woman or this man is enduring abuse that is now at the level of continuous for a while, not uh, sanctifying life, and it's character murder. And there on that grounds, uh, what, what we must also do is, we must honor the high view God has of marriage. How does God see marriage? We can't just look at a person and then try to dishonor. We, we can't, let me say it this way. We can dishonor the high view of marriage when we allow abuse to con can continue unended to such a point that that person, that, that woman or man is, is a wreck. That's not right. I, don't, I cannot mm -hmm. agree that God wants us to go to that level. But this is a difficult one. It's something that must go through long and hard counseling with the church and there must be the, must be a decision that's made with the church council or with the eldership and that that's ve it's very important in such cases that there's that that it just shows you church membership is very important because how are you going to deal with situations like that this if you are not even part of a church and if you call yourself a christian but you're not part of the church or you don't have a good relationship with your church or a good relationship with your church council or your, your elders how are you going to deal with such situations um that just emphasized to me that church membership and being in covenant with your wife or husband in marriage and with the church is very important for a christian yeah. guys can we move on or is there something else yeah no i think we can something move else on. to add Okay, I think we move to a complete different question now. Um, this one is connected, I assume, to John 1, where, G where the Bible says Jesus is the Word, and uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, you know, the Logos. I assume this is connected to that. Um, and so how is Jesus the Word of God? Um, maybe I can just start by introduction in one sense, Jesus is the word of God because he is the word became flesh. He is the one who came to reveal the father to us. Jesus said, if you see me, you see God. He is the one who give life or body, if you want to call it that metaphorically, to who God is. He is the one who physically came to reveal God to us. In that sense, Jesus is the word of God. He is the one who bring the word of God to its full realization. Something to add, guys? Um, I would just add Hebrews 1. Um, as well, you know, in the past, God spoke to his people mm. through prophets and in many times and many other ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, uh, who he appointed the heir of all things, you know. And, and so in Jesus, you know, when we spoke about eschatology, we spoke about how they are types. And so we, we see all these Old Testament things like the tabernacle and the sacrificial system, um, you know, the, the Davidic throne. Um, the priesthood and, and Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those things. And, and all of those things, really what they show us is the, um, the characteristic and nature of God. And Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of that. Jesus, you know, um, I, I preached on this two weeks ago, but, but Jesus is the grace of God revealed to us. Jesus is the glory of God revealed to us. Jesus is... Um, you know, all of these things revealed to mm. us in its most perfect form. And, and so um, in that way, like Jesus speaks to us about the, the very nature and characteristics of God. Yeah. Just I'll, I'll just conclude with saying that one theologian said the following. It's quite helpful. He said, 
if John had simply written God became a human being, Miyaki referenced John 1 there, that would have given a false impression, leading one to think that the Lord, uh, so God himself, was no longer filling the universe or reigning in heaven, having abandoned his throne to take up residence here. Instead, John tells us that it was the divine word that became a human being, and through the word we can know God personally. I think that's quite, quite helpful. Yeah, I think also the word logos is very much connected to some of God's attributes, like his self-revelation. Um, you know, um, the, in, the, in, 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 the, in Greek philosophy, uh, the word logos was seen as the divine reason, um, uh, you know, a, a philosophical principle of divine reason. Jesus came to show what the true logos is. The true logos is the second person, the Trinity. He's the one who, who are the embodiment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. There were so many prophecies about him. He came to realize those prophecies, and that makes him the word of God. He's the one who brings God's promises to life. He's the surety of God's promises. He's the one who brings the full special revelation of God to us. Um, and there's, those are many things that are connected to God's self-revelation. And if you think of any other religion, uh, the, the concept of God becoming a person while God is the creator of us is not present. So in, in, in any other religion, God is really just a philosophy. God is just a pie in the sky in a certain sense. He's just a floating idea. Jesus came as the word of God to come in embody the word of God to us. Christianity is the only religion that can, in a certain, in a metaphorical way, put a face to Christianity or to, or to our God. Now, we don't believe that God is physical, so don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, it's true, if it's true that God created mankind and God wants to reveal himself because self-revelation is part of his nature, he wants to, he's, he, he, not he wants to, he's going to reveal himself. The best way he would do that is through the person of Christ. And that's the word of God. Jesus became the word of God Although he was eternally the word of God, he never had a beginning. He had never had an end. He's the Alpha and Omega. But that word, that, that living person became flesh and took on flesh and live among us. And that's how I would say what it mm. means. This is the word of God. In, in, in the, it's obviously a big topic. There's a lot to say about this. But briefly, I think that's what one can say. Guys, I think um, we're running out of time. Um, we are already nearing an hour, and I think there's one question left, which is a, a nice one. Uh, we always like evangelism, you know. We always like to <laughs> to share the gospel. So when this comes up, my heart beats a few beats extra. But anyway, this one is: what is the best mode of evangelism, uh, friendship evangelism, or to strangers? Now, just to explain the question, because I shortened the question because it was quite long in a way. The question came along that there's different views about how we should evangelize. Some people say we should rather share the gospel with people we know, people we have built friendships with. Um, that's how I understand the question. And there's other people that say, no, we should also share the gospel with total strangers, like going into street evangelism where you don't know a person and you just out of the blue walk to a person and say, I want <clears> to <throat> tell you about Jesus Christ. Um, there are different camps on this topic. I know there are people who say the best way of discipleship and evangelism is friendship evangelism, where you first get to know people, befriending them over a long time, and then, you know, then in that context, try to share the gospel with them. Um, my personal short take on this, before I open up to you guys, is I don't see an either or here. I see a both. I think evangelism is organic. There's no method. There's no prescribed way. It happens at so many different places. Friendship, strangers, is only two of them. There are so many different contexts. Um, the most important thing is that the gospel is preached in word. That thing, that quote that says, uh, preach, uh, preach the gospel and if necessary use words, that's a false quote. We proclaim facts about Christ. We proclaim a person and we explain that person to people. And we do it in any way, any place, in season, out of season. I think that's the answer. And in a way, you can say friendship or strangers, in season, out season. There's no rule that says, no, we must only do it through friendships. Yeah, just, just to, to 
to maybe look at this in a different light. I think um, what Yaku has mentioned, um, the question is how many people are actually sharing their faith or proclaiming the gospel? And, and I think that that's, um, for me, a bigger question because, you know, if you look at actually stats that guys have done in terms of various surveys, uh, the percentage of actual Christians sharing in either or context, whether it's going out onto the streets, uh, doing open air preaching, uh, or just you know, uh, you know, sharing the sharing the uh, um, the gospel with people they know, family, friends, colleagues, etc., it's, it's still extremely, extremely low. So I think the question really is why aren't Christians sharing the gospel? You know, period. Uh, whether it's you know, with friends or family or you know, why aren't they going out corporately with with the actual church? Um, and I think you know that's a maybe a, a, a discussion that we could have maybe one evening. And I think we want to do that. But um, yeah, I, I think you know, at the end of the day, my my bigger concern also would be: Are you actually sharing the gospel? So when you think about maybe friendship evangelism, and, and it's, I think what, what we see. In today's, uh, I guess, evangelical movement, friendship evangelism is not about sharing the gospel. Sadly, it's actually about you know coming alongside someone, and then after you know six, seven months, then you know uh, maybe maybe sharing the gospel and uh, almost uh, earning the right to to, to proclaim uh, Christ to them. And I I, I think it's really uh, almost a wrong approach. I think. You know, if you if you, if you want to speak to your neighbour or you want to speak to uh, again your um, a colleague or, or someone that you've known for ten years, for me, d you know, d don't actually deceive the person. And what I mean by that is, be very open with them that you are a Christian uh, and that uh, you, you know that you haven't got an ulterior motive with them. Uh, you know that you're trying to build up a friendship and then earn the right to share the gospel. That, that, that's actually almost deceitful. And deceptive. Mm -hmm. So, whether you are, um, whatever, uh, whatever circle you are in, and in whatever context, ensure that you're open. You know, you 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 are open with that person. Now, that doesn't mean that sharing the gospel on the streets of Cape Town is going to look the same as sharing the gospel with a colleague. Of course not. I think there's again, there's many aspects to look at, and that's again maybe. Uh, I don't think we have time to do, to to dive into that. But the point here is. Um, whether you are considering, uh, you know, gospel ministry amongst friends or strangers, just ensure that you are actually proclaiming Christ and you actually uh, not not just, uh, uh, you know, being friends with the person for, for for the totally, I guess, wrong reason. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot to, to maybe speak on this topic. It's actually a big, big question. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can discuss it in a future date. Yeah. more detail. I just want to add quickly, uh, Colin, before you can jump in, is uh, friendship evangelism is very popular and it's taught uh, as, a, as a, even as a method, you know, very method. And this methodical approach to evangelism even on itself is a problem for me, to be honest. But friendship evangelism has become a topic of our day. And I find sometimes friendship evangelism can also be abused for um, seeker sensitive yeah, you know, exactly. Because now you you are hooing, you are hooing people into the church through through friendship, and so some and there's nothing wrong per se with friendship evangelism, but some churches use it as a method of getting they call seekers. The concept of seekers is even biblically a problem, because there's only one true seeker, and this is those who the Spirit has given life in their souls. But, you know, um, so you will have a coffee shop at church and you invite your friends there. It becomes a whole context of, um, you know, play, uh, um, yeah, I don't know how the word is, but playing down the gospel and being friendly to the unbelieving world for the sake of getting people in. Yeah, I would, I would raise, when I hear the term friendship evangelism or only evangelize in like these small closed settings, generally it raises a kind of seeker sensitive alarm for me um, where I'm like, I'm concerned about that. And I think there's obvious and real concerns, but in the same breath, I also recognize that not everyone is gifted to yeah. 
to go and do open air or street evangelism. And there are times where people are gifted to take the gospel to their workplaces and their families. And what I would emphasize, just as when we started, this isn't an either or. This mm. is a, um, you know, our problem really is that Christians aren't taking the gospel out enough. Mm. And so, you know, whether you're doing it in small, closed, private settings or whether you're doing it in the streets of Cape Town, I rejoice. And and I say, like Philippians 1.18, I think Paul really puts it really, he's talking about a slightly different issue there, but he, he just says the important thing is that in every way, whether mm. from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yeah, you mm. know, and, and, and I would... I would say the same thing as like we should. Yeah, let, let, me put it like, let me yeah. let me let let us maybe put it like this. You get a method. It's an official method. Mm. I mean, you go you go to places. They give you a course. They call the course friendship yeah. evangelism. But evangelism through friendship is biblical. But mm. friendship evangelism, in my view, sometimes means something different. It's more a concept. Yeah. It's more a program program approach to evangelism in the church which yeah. is something different for me. But to meet people, befriending them, and in that context of being their friends, sharing the gospel, that's for me something yeah. different as the method of friendship evangelism. Guys, I think it actually boils yeah, down that's to, what... I think it comes down to our first discussion about Reformed theology. It's really mm. about are you synergistic in your approach or are you yes. monogistic? Yeah. Yeah. I think monogistic, the reality is when, when we talk about what is the best part of evangelism, it actually doesn't really matter. You know? Yeah. Because God, God give, saying, give life to a soul if he wants. Nothing will stop him. Exactly. Just in again, life, yeah. <laughs> this is why, um, this is going to be controversial, but not to our listeners. This is why Calvinism promotes evangelism and doesn't take away from it. Because we don't have to sit and think of ways to trick people into believing the gospel. We can just proclaim it and trust God will do what is good and right with it. And God is even sovereign over our mistakes. We don't even yeah. to have do it so perfectly that if you're not perfect in your proclamation, no one will be saved. No. God used all means possible, sometimes just three words, to bring life to a soul. Because it's depending on Him and not you. Although you're an instrument, and that doesn't mean we don't want to empower ourselves and equip ourselves to do better evangelism. Yes, we will. But the idea that we need to have methods and this different approaches to have better success and see greater numbers. That's an unbiblical approach. Yeah. yeah. I Just to add, I got saved listening to a prosperity preacher. And then I became reformed in a church that instead of sermons played Rob Bell Numa videos. So if a prosperity preacher can share enough of the gospel that I can get saved, I'm sure that every single one of you out there's meager efforts of evangelism can make an, an effect for the kingdom. And I think all three of us would just say, go and actually evangelize. So, yeah. you know, so stop thinking about it. It's actually, uh, you know, I was actually listening to um, uh, a couple of uh, solid brothers uh, in the, uh, I won't say who, uh, but the point was the one guy said, evangelism is so much simpler than we actually make it out to be. You know, it's so much simpler. And we actually complicate things with all this nonsense out there. Again, you know, if the Lord has saved you by, you know, and you know what the gospel is, you know, go and share the gospel and uh, the Lord will do the rest. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah guys. So I, I I, think it was our first Q&A we did. We're going to do this. Uh, we're going to try to do this every uh, last Monday of the month. It went well. I think we will uh, um, improve in the future in, in the way we do it. Um, uh, and also in using this new program, hopefully, uh, you know. Uh, but anyway, we want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and thank you for sending in your questions. Uh, sorry, Colin, you want to add something? Uh, I just wanted to add, there was one last comment I saw from Chris Ferndale. Um, he was just, he WhatsApped me his comment um, just on what reading material with regards to eschatology. So I just quickly went to my bookshelf and I got this three books that I'll recommend. If you want to learn about the Olivet Discourse mm. and Eschatology of Victory from J. Marcellus Kick, I think is, is very good. Yeah. Commentary on Revelation, there's The Returning King from Vern Poitras. Mm. I love this book. It made me understand Revelation. It's actually and then, free on, on, his, on their website. Yes, everyone. it's free online. And then a third one that I don't have in my bookshelf is The Millennium from Lorraine mm. Buchner. Those three, mm. I think, are 
are very, very good, very mm -hmm. simple, easy to read. You don't have to have a degree in theology. It, it makes things simple. So just uh, I saw your comment, Chris, and thought yeah. I'd just recommend those books. So I, I actually made a list of, uh, because somebody also asked me this question, I actually made a list of books that I can recommend, uh, I which include those ones you mentioned. I actually will share it on our Facebook page, so yeah. so our audience can go and uh, look at that. I will share the link, the, the books there and so forth. And then uh, just also before I close, there was two questions, one from Eric and one from Lisa, which I want to acknowledge and say that's great questions related to marriage. Uh, but like I said, guys, uh, this is a difficult topic. It's a big topic. And also, as you can see, time has run out on us. It, it, to address all the, all the different ones, is, um, it's, it's going to be difficult. Uh, there are many questions around this. So please don't feel that we ignore your questions or don't want to answer them. We, we did say from the, from the word go that we will um, answer. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Well, one is coming up, so please send them in again. And there's Anyone the other 10 that? questions from Enrique. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, brother. Okay, guys. So with that, then I think uh, we're going to call it the evening. And um, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for sending in your questions. We really appreciate it. Please share this program as far and wide as you can with your friends and family. Go and like our Facebook page. I'll sh we'll also share the link on, on our Facebook page. Uh, yeah, so just search for for Crossroads Cape and you'll find it. Uh, and then like and go and subscribe uh, to and, and like the bell on our YouTube channel. And then um, we'll see you next week, Monday, uh, same time, uh, half past eight. And uh, thank you then so much for joining us. Good night. Mm -hmm.